So welcome everyone. Thanks for showing up for this presentation. Um, we feel honored that so many people stayed. In our presentation entitled Black Skin, White Guns, and you will see the reference to this title later, Becoming Colonizers in Resident Evil 5, we will talk about the interrelationship between game design, pleasure, and racial colonial history. This means we will talk about the entanglement as players and designers in colonial history. And we will tackle this case of Resident Evil 5. How many of you have played that game? Okay, oh, that's around. Lot, actually. It's actually a third, so. Yeah. Great, so uh, usually I would introduce it now a little bit, uh, uh, but uh, for that third, of course, you've experienced it, but the other two thirds, uh, for you, it, uh, Resident Evil is a, is a survival uh, horror slash panic simulator game that, uh, uh, that plays in the, in, uh, where the player plays against uh, uh, an industrial, military, industrial, international drug slash biological warfare company that... <laughs> <laughs> Entitled Ouroboros, I think. Ouroboros. Yeah, no, Umbrella. Umbrella, Umbrella and Umbrella Corporation. Yes, okay. Yeah, Ouroboros I is it now. the virus, actually. Yes, I spoiled it. <laughs> but anyway, um, um, that is the setting you're playing in. And it's, it's, it's characterized by you as player being very limited in what you can do. And that, of course, enforces the, the feeling of being uh, in, in a weak position against the horde of enemies. So we picked this example particularly because. It, we think that there can be some uh, links to other games that work in a similar way, so that's why we use it as kind of a case example, what's going on. And secondly, there exists a research culture around Resident Evil 5. So even before the launch of the game, we already knew what the things that are wrong with the game. <laughs> um, so it has, been, it has been attacked or criticized for the way it represents blackness and black African people. And as Stephen Totilo, a journalist, put it uh, when he saw the trailer, he's, he said, it's an invitation to literally shoot poor people. So then the game came out and it evoked a lot of critique from academics as well. And they have also mainly focused on the representation of race and also tackled uh, this in regard to colonial history. But there is something that is kind of lacking in this criticism, which is um, the idea of playability and pleasure. So this is also expressed in in uh, the uh, revision of Tortillo's opinion later when he played the game and said, it's no longer problematic because these people that you shoot are no longer human as soon as you play the game. And in a way, we want to put a point to this aspect of playability um, and dismantle this myth that pleasure works against the politics of a game or that kind of there's a versus of pleasure versus politics. So we kind of work with three claims during this presentation. Uh, the first claim is that game, de uh, game design decisions don't arise at random, but in reference to what we already know about race and the world in general. The second claim is that what we know about race manifests in very mundane things and practices. If we think about back about the, what you see here is the, like the history of uh, com uh, commodity racism that started from the late 19th century and where this message of the great white explorer in a foreign country was um, manifested in coffee, biscuits, children's stories you see on the, to the right, on the right bottom, there's a children's, Danish children's book that I found weeks ago in a supermarket um, which tells the story of the little sword Sambo. Um, and of course, so the idea here is that um, images of race are just communicated via very ordinary objects. And in pleasing, nice and intimate spaces of 
uh, personal relationships, like when, when do we drink coffee, when do we use soap, when do we read children's stories, Every, all of these are apparently neutral, nice, unpolitical situations, right? So the third claim is then, in relation to this, that video games update and recontextualize these old images to a certain extent. Um, there are things that stay the same, that are kind of reproduced, and things that are different. For example, that games are playable in, uh, yeah, in difference to <laughs> coffee or books. So there are some structures that uh, remain and some structures that are updated. Overall, we would argue that pleasure, it is pleasure that makes racism sustainable. There's always two sides of the experience. We have misery on the one side, which is kind of the, the experience uh, resulting from colonialism for those it ensnares. So uh, the black experience that we uh, represent on our coffee um, table. Um, and then there's also this pleasure element of the other side of experience, the pleasure, the pleasure of consuming those images which is also an expression of privilege, of course. Um, yeah, so games and commodity racism, that's kind of the context of this presentation. Um, and we argue that uh, racism doesn't only exist in the game's visual surface, but in the experiences of play. And the way experiences of play are structured, that's important, the way they're structured. How joy is stimulated, um, how we experience play as our, part of our day-to-day -day relationships um, and how these experiences turn into cherished memories afterwards. So here's a confession. It's gonna be very personal. It's maybe the most personal thing I've ever presented. Um, and it, this presentation is kind of the result of a leisurely, um, leisurely uh, practice of playing Resident Evil 5 with my partner. So it's gonna shed some light on my personal life as well. And the reason for this is also um, nourished by one of my favorite and maybe one of the most important uh, post-colonial personalities, uh, researchers, philosophers, and he's also a psychiatrist, uh, Franz Fanon, who uh, famously pointed to the very mechanics of colonialism. In his, uh, in his accounts, he focused more on French colonialism, but he has been discussed in a wider context of um, how we can think about race and, ra and exploitation of racial images in colonialism. Um, and his two seminal works, Black Skin, White Masks, and The Wretched of the Earth, um, are very personal um, discussions of reports, experiences, and desires, and of course, the pain and the misery of what he calls the black man. He also talks about women, but he's Freudian, and he's also, we're talking about work in the 50s and 60s, so there you go, that's his formulation. We will have other formulations that are equally a bit out of context for today's kind of racial awareness that should be yeah, um, yeah. so that's the one side. He, we will use his voice as kind of a commentator on what we went through in this game. And the other side? I don't ah, know. the other yeah. side, yeah, that was my, that was my cue, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and the other side is Resident Evil 5, which is a game that uh, is part five, as the name says, of the Resident Evil series that was started in 1969, uh, 96, by uh, Capcom, a Japanese games developer, a quite big Japanese games developer. Um, uh, that is a pure entertainment product for today's market. But the actual focus of our talk is, of course, the, the line in between that you have, again, more to say about. You have to work in our cues, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we, we're going to focus on, on this tension between misery and pleasure. 
And how, do, how are we going to do this? We're going to respond to, to Fanon's assumption that we cannot be objective about these things. We have to delve into our own experience and we have to talk about uh, what, what it feels like to be in the game and to actually become the colonizer. So that's what I did in this uh, co-op. <laughs> yeah, that was the keyword. With Thank my you. partner. Yes. Um, um, the thing is, I'm not the partner. I'm here just as the stand-in for the partner. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the partner is Simon, who will be exposed indirectly by in 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 a few seconds. And uh, the the thing to note about uh, that I'm I'm just the presentation partner. Um, You're the discourse partner. And the discourse partner, exactly. And uh, the 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 thing you should know about playing the game in co-op is that it is slightly different. We will highlight some of the differences as a co-op experience than as a single player experience. Most of those differences don't play a crucial role. If they do, we will talk about them in a minute. But the way we're going to proceed is by personal vignettes. And I wrote three of them um, in reflection to what I experienced with my partner in Resident Evil 5, the co-op. Should I start? Yes. So vignette one. Having been off the Resident Evil track for a while, I was not sure what to think of Simon's proposition to give Resident Evil 5 a shot. He said, it is mo one of the most problematic games in video game history. It is also the pinnacle of co-op gaming. That I want to see for myself. And before I know it, I'm seated in front of a big screen in the living room holding PlayStation Controller 1. This lands me in the role of protagonist Chris Redfield, while Simon is bound to join as Sheva Alomar. I, Chris, enter the scene in my shiny Land Rover, piercing the dusty landscape while my hyperextended muscles fill the driver cabin. The initial cutscene presents us with a highly resolved or high resolution Africa. I must admit, I've never been to this continent, but I clearly recognize the bush drums and realistically disintegrating buildings sandy roads, black faces lurking behind the crumbling walls. This is the AIDS campaign and the Evening News Africa. Now the ca camera exhibits a female silhouette from a low angle. I see Shevers behind before I even know her name. Welcome to Africa, she says. Her slim physique, straight hair and western clothes easily conforming to what my Austrian sisters and brothers would recognize as beautiful. Only moments later, I watch Sheva get groped by a black security man. I do nothing. The cutscenes tells me to focus on Sheva's tightly filled jeans instead. After the scene is over, Sheva is gone, and I, Chris, wait in an authentically rundown African place in I don't know where until Simon bothers to press start on controller 2. A menu appears, which makes Sheva join again. This causes my immaculately unsplit screen to be cut in half, a splitting process compromising my Chris space whenever we enter the game. Simon apologizes on Sheva's behalf. Hours later, Simon utters the wish to upgrade her sniper rifle. I sigh and pick up the controller again. Okay. I select the organize option. Which one is it, I ask, inspecting our arsenal. The left one, he responds, aware that the inventory is not my favorite place. I am incompetently fumbling around on my controller, pressing a couple of buttons and opening random windows until I finally find the desired upgrade selection. In the meantime, Simon has put his own controller down. Phew, $3,000? That's expensive, he says, as we look at the upgrade firepower option. Let's go for something more affordable, he suggests. But tired of the inventory, I ignore his suggestion and buy him her expensive upgrade. He waves gratefulness, in imitating Sheva's standard phrase, which I cannot Im imitate as well. Thanks, partner. I, I cannot say it. <laughs> As the one responsible for Sheva's well-being, I experience mercy, generosity, 
It's fine, I say, with full entitlement on Chris' behalf. We have to hurry on, by the way, we are oh. quite behind. Um, um, uh, so what we, what we see here is uh, um, we tried in the paper to isolate a few different aspects of what, what just took place in this short segment of gameplay. And um, uh, you put it to words, you better than this. <laughs> I have to... Oh, yeah. Oh, no, but what, what is happening here is established. First of all, we see that Chris enters the scene first, right? He enters Africa first, even though it's supposed to be Sheva's native place. Secondly, on the more mechanical level, we have this inventory uh, privilege <laughs> where Sheva is not even able to select her own weapon upgrades. So uh, we have, we, I, Chris, had to take care of uh, the upgrades of Sheva slash Simon, so I, had co I could completely overrule his own wishes and desires and like suggestions of, of what he would like to invest in or not. So I'm kind of entitled to be great, to be merciful and generous. Um, so there's some kind of hierarchy embedded, like unnecessary hier hierarchy embedded, not only in the space, but in the space of the game, in the level space, but also in the way we are able to organize our inventory. Um, so, and then in, like, Franz Fanon gives a, um, a kind of descriptive, actually an overview of what happens in the space of Resident Evil. So this is usually how, in, in the history of colonialism, uh, black spaces were represented. So it's a place of ill fame, and we immediately get this in the cutscene that there's people, we don't care even about what, where they go, where, whether they die, what, who they are, it doesn't really matter as long as we can pierce and penetrate the landscape with our Land Rover, everything's gonna be fine. Um, should we move on? Because we I think we should leave. move on, and we should uh, make the reading very short. Okay, yeah. <laughs> because we have three more minutes. Oh, no, okay. <laughs> so after, after hours of non-consecutive play, we finally arrive at the marshlands by boat. Like an old tourist couple, we are mindlessly drawn towards the bold crosses on the map, eventually reaching the promised dock. We decide to comb the backlands for a more desired object, the Shaman Slate, a puzzle piece that so happens to be in possession of the so-called Magini villagers. As we enter the settlement on a realistically rendered dirt path, we find the small shacks to be mysteriously abandoned. However, there are valuables to draw from the villagers' bedroom, rooms and kitchen shelves, and most importantly from the beautifully designed vases and pots standing outside on improvised verandas. Our kicking and punching of tribal art has a peaceful, meditative melody to it. It is followed by the soft clatter of breaking porcelain and the flashy rewards hidden inside. Shotgun shells, pot plants and all, our all-time favorite, gold small. The pottery, far from being meaning and worthless to us, has a higher purpose. It has to be smashed and transformed into something assisting our mission, to save more Africans from themselves because they are effect, uh, infected, of course, that's the explanation, and by neutralizing them. I find myself soothed by the prospect of an exotic vase in the distance. It equals the promise of better firepower. To the villagers themselves, the contents of their domestic environments are utterly useless. The flash grenades, the shotgun shells, these objects are weirdly out of place in this tribal setting. These objects have been placed here for us ready to be picked up before, purposefully, before we purposefully trigger the villagers wrath by picking up the shaman's lead. So, <laughs> so <laughs> uh, what, we, what we see here is actually the commodification of every uh, object that is present in this village. So everything that is uh, um, a part of the village can be destroyed and by destroying it uh, uh, transformed into an object that is actually functional that is used by the useful to the player like shotgun shells herbs and other uh, uh, combat related items um, um, most of those objects then when they are transformed are of course in a way misplaced those infected they don't use weapons why would they own shotgun shells why but would they own gold small they kind of use weapons but different weapons so it's, yeah, it's kind of not. apparent that their, their spears like shotgun shells are useless for their spears yeah. 
So what we in the end see is, a, is, is the generation of value by entering that space and cleaning it up in a way by smashing everything to pieces. So we are actually at this moment over time. Should yes. we skip the third and just... Okay, we keep doing it. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm trying to keep short with the third one. Yeah. You can read the Fanon quote, it's a commentary, and I mean, we cannot claim his voice either, so you can read his, <laughs> his uh, quote. Um, we know what is coming next. It's the same, it's the situation uh, with the Magini, but how can we know what's coming next? We cannot see the Magini yet, but we can hear them. The crescendo of exotic bush drums gets more excited, ever more wild. We ought to watch out. This is our chance to get scared and entertained. You Have some Magini, please. What pleasant, angry shout in the distance. I understand no word. This must be the villagers wrath that we ordered. Excellent. I glance at Simon. Are you excited as well? Can we do this together? We are about to engage in one of the most rewarding trust exercises in video game history, the co-op melee attack. We get into position as the enraged mob composed of town magini and big men approach us. Are you ready? asks Simon. If I'm shooting the man in the leg, will you melee him? Okay, I say, suspiciously approaching the rampaging crowd. No, 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 he's got me, I shout, unaware of that Simon and Sheva have just fired a perfectly placed leg shot on the town man. Stunned, the town machine crouches, holds his leg, and yells in pain, performing his programmed leg grab animation. A first success. Now, melee him, demands Simon. I'm trying to, I yell back. I run Chris around in circles unintentionally. I press down all the thumbs I have, but I can't seem to fixate the machine properly. There, a promising, promisingly blinking message Square uppercut appears on top of the Magini. Finally, I mash all the buttons I find, including square. There, Chris' white flash powerfully stabs into the roaring unknown black body, making it fall and disintegrate slowly. As it gets more and more transparent, the dissolving heat heap of black man gives space to another option. Pick up gold small. In a bit, in, I'm a bit disappointed, hoping that one of the next bodies will contain something more valuable, like a pot plant or maybe some shotgun shells. But rewards are rewards. As I walk Chris over the satisfying sound of picking up, I feel like this is my well-earned reward for being helpful. I've done something right. I have collaborated with my partner. I successfully uppercut the enemy. I have outplayed my poor navigation skills and was at the right place at the right time to perform a beautifully animated melee attack. Uh, and then our, our experiences will have turned into sweet memories soon after. Weeks later, Simon say, says over a beer with friends, that, had my, that might have been one of the most fun I've ever had with you in a co-op game. I agree. <laughs> so uh, one of the things that you observe in playing Resident Evil 5 is that actually the Machini are just a beginner standard enemy. They are very weak, they trigger only very uh, uh, valueless uh, rewards like gold small. The bigger gold you get from the white enemies later in the game, actually. <laughs> also, uh, the Machini are intelligent for zombies. They can communicate and stuff like that. Uh, but they are not as intelligent. They don't, they don't uh, expose their intelligence as much as some later enemies of a different skin color. So that is the progress from this primitive pride uh, black world to uh, science centers with intelligent white people is the progress of the game. And it comes with uh, uh, increasing rewards and increasing uh, value to the player generated by killing enemies. Yeah, so that we can see that there's a whitening of, of the levels. There is also black people appearing, but these have now been kind of established as the ordinary kind of obstacle that you casually run over in order to really get to the cutscenes that exposes the thoughts, ideas, and, and uh, evil plans of the white people in charge of all this misery. So also the, the kind of power, power, like the representation of power and by speaking up, by exposing plans and actually having a voice is always color-coded. So what is this is a famous quote that Chris always says when he comes across anything, no, anything actually. He has <laughs> no, no clue that is also like... He has yeah. no clue yeah. what is going on. <laughs> so he gets sent to this uh, strange country and continually asks, what, what is this? <laughs> uh, 
And um, his personal quest actually is successful. Of course, if you play as Chris, your quest as Chris is successful, but it's the zombie genre. So, of course, the overall uh, looming uh, uh, apocalypse, uh, apocalypse stays uh, uh, present. He just he, he cannot bring the system down. He just solves his mission. So, in a way, uh, he is the most successful participant in this whole endeavor. Um, the thing that we wanted to highlight is that Resident Evil actually it is a great game. As a pleasure generating piece of software, it is totally awesome. I hope that <laughs> came across with our <laughs> excitement also. But it makes so blunt use of colonial tropes that it is uh, um, um, that this, 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 this contrast is, uh, was what triggered our interest in the game. And we, we, after finishing it, I mean, we both have played it, just not together. After finishing it, we asked ourselves why we accept this uh, setting in a game. Why does it have to be a game like, why does it have to be set in a world that is uh, colored like this? Colored why are we like complacent this? to accept this kind of representational uh, um, suggestion, proposition in a game that is actually very enjoyable? And, exactly. and, we, and we suggest that, uh, like, maybe we are out of time, but we have three suggestions for how, uh, what you could have done to the representational aspect of this game. Just minor twists that would have made the whole game a more appropriate game. And that one would, would be that Trevor would have her own character, her own voice. Yes and no, but this is like the last three sentences. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Trevor could have a real personality, not just this second-class personality. She could then, have talked back, or at least have some own agency in her own inventory. Yeah. <laughs> and the other, someone could have answered the question, what is this? There's, there are so, much, so many hooks in this game that would require, and that would generate an interesting game if they were answered, but no one answered, what is this? Or it maybe just, even just comment on, uh, or make, make yeah. Chris ignorance more explicit. Yeah. So self-awareness would have helped it a lot. Um, and the other thing is, uh, if he would have failed, the whole parable would, be, would have turned out differently if Chris would fail in his mission, I think. Well, that's the question now to you all, actually. <laughs> would the game have changed? Uh, for, for those who have played it, of course, it's more difficult to answer this. Maybe not more difficult to answer this in one general. Uh, in regard to other games, maybe. Uh, would something have changed? Or, yeah, what... And How what? can we? Yeah. Yeah. And what? So, sorry again for taking much more time than we were supposed to. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot, but we have to hurry. Uh, so perhaps we have time for one answer for your question, <laughs> and perhaps one additional question if you are doing it fast. Uh, thank you, that was very interesting. Uh, I'm actually trying to write about this game myself, so I'm, I'm very interested in what you've got to say. Um, my question is about your theoretical context. Uh, you use Franz Fanon, um, who's writing in a very different colonial context than the one in which the game is produced and consumed. Uh, he's, he's not talking about neo-colonialism as it exists now. So I wonder, why you're, why you're using him. And then secondly, you've bracketed the fact that this is a game produced in Japan with a very different uh, idea of blackness and whiteness and colonialism. So uh, when you say it could be a more appropriate game if certain changes are made, it, you're, you're really saying it would be more appropriate for European players, is that right? I'm going to answer your second question first. There's always a market. These games don't just, they're not produced, like they, they, there's a complicated relationship to the, with, between the Japanese producer and the context it is produced for. So in a way, I, I can kind of point you to, to Adrian Shaw's work, uh, Gaming at the Edge, where she discusses this in more detail, um, also in regard to Resident Evil 5. Um, that it's, it's kind of a complicated projection by the Japanese producer on a Western kind of European, maybe American market. So the idea is what would people, what would white people like is kind of like in this proposition. Like what can we identify with? This is a question that uh, game 
designers and producers struggle with in order to launch appropriate tit uh, selling titles to their markets. So it's a bit complicated. And I wouldn't kind of, <laughs> yeah. And the first one is actually, if I, I, when I picked for no, the question that drove me was, how far back can we go in colonial history, in colonial, post-colonial thinking? Um, how far can we go away and still find parallels between the past and what is currently happening? Does that answer your question? It's kind of, of course, uh, Franz Fanon tackles French colonialism, but he also, through his reports on, um, on, the, on black misery, how he calls it, uh, he shows, he highlights some mechanics, some of the mechanics that are a kind of underlying, in his perspective, underlying this whole system, the logic of colonialism. So um, the contexts are different. I totally agree with that. It's, uh, but, but still, the question is one of remembering the past and remembering uh, um, our um, forethinkers and how they have already uh, had um, these observations in the 50s and 60s. Thank you.